Welcome to the Live Wire at UNC Charlotte, our forum for conversations with newsmakers from campus and beyond. I'm Will City. My guest today is Dr. John David Smith, professor of history here at UNC Charlotte. He focuses his scholarship and research primarily on the American South, slavery, and the Civil War. His most recent book, Lincoln and the U.S. Colored Troops, is out now, and that's what he's here to talk to us about today. Dr. Smith, welcome to the Live Wire. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Let's talk about the title first, which I think uh, will strike some people when they initially read it. U.S. Colored Troops references an official classification that the government gave these groups. Why did you choose that title, though? Well, it's the official title of the African-American regiments that served in Union Blue during the Civil War. In March 1863, the War Department established a, a special bureau entitled the Bureau of Colored Troops, capital C, capital T. And then the government organized 133 regiments of U.S. colored infantry, uh, other regiments of uh, artillery, light artillery, heavy artillery, cavalry, and their official title was the U.S. colored troops. The title responds to Lincoln's role in establishing, authorizing, and initiating the um, arming of African Americans during the Civil War, which is an essential part of what I call military emancipation. And starting from a global perspective, how great an impact did these recently emancipated African American troops have on the Civil War? Is it safe to say that the Union would not have been victorious without them? Well, I think that's a, that's a simplistic conclusion. Let me backtrack a little bit. I think globally, and I was glad that you framed this beyond the American experience, globally the emancipation of the four million slaves during the American Civil War served as a clarion call. There were two other major slave societies in the world, in the Western Hemisphere at this point, in, in Brazil and Cuba, and both of those slave societies crumbled later after the American Civil War. So not only did the emancipation of the slaves in the United States serve as a call for people of color worldwide to, to seek and achieve their freedom, but it also gave a message that African Americans could, and other people of color worldwide, could not only strike for their own freedom, but they could assume the citizens' right, the right to carry arms, and play a major role in affecting their emancipation and their move towards freedom and the rights of citizenship. Uh, the African American soldiers composed between 10 and 12 percent of the U.S. troops in the American Civil War. I think it would be simplistic to say that without the 10 to 12 percent of those troops, the North wouldn't have defeated the South or the end of the Confederacy, uh, particularly since ma ma many of the utilizations of the African Americans were in backwater assignments. However, those assignments thereby did free up white soldiers, which is something you may want to talk with me about later, the levels of discrimination that the U.S. colored troops experienced. So I, I don't think you could say that the uh, U.S. colored troops played a decisive direct role in federal victory, but they played a very important symbolic role in the entire emancipation experience. Now initially, Lincoln opposed the general emancipation and arming of African Americans. What was his approach originally, and how did that change over the course of the conflict? Excellent question. Uh, as you know, uh, Lincoln was elected president in November 1860, and during the Republicans' campaign, he made clear that uh, the Republican Party platform was not designed to eliminate slavery where it existed. However, the Republicans, starting in 1856 in their first presidential campaign, when John C. Fremont was their standard bearer, had opposed the extension of slavery into the federal territories. And Lincoln made clear in the 1860 campaign that that would be his approach. He also understood the constitutional protections of slavery where it existed. So as you'll recall in his first inaugural of March 1861, and you'll also recall that seven southern states by March of 1861 had already seceded had already established what they called a provisional Confederate States of America government. 
in Montgomery, Alabama. Lincoln said, now look, uh, slavery is protected in the Constitution, and our government cannot do anything about your slaves, but we will not allow this union. Lincoln argued that the nation could not dissolve. He would not allow it to dissolve. He would not allow federal property, be, property to be tampered with. But he made clear that as long as the southern states did not break any federal laws, slavery would be protected. That said, after secession and firing on Fort Sumter and the addition of four other southern slave states, including North Carolina, joining the new Confederate States of America, the firing on Fort Sumter and the uh, acquisition of federal forts through other places in the South and the tampering with federal property threw a whole new uh, element into the question of slavery. And in fact, during the first almost year of the Civil War, Lincoln tried and tried to um, honor slavery, but when it became clear to him that the two forces of disunion and slavery were intertwined, he, as you know from reading my book, took what I call linear steps, linear steps in uh, moving towards the direction of emancipation and then military emancipation. And in my book, Lincoln and the U.S. Color Troops, I argue that Lincoln's steps towards those twin goals, emancipation and then military emancipation, were more linear, more direct than previous historians have credited Lincoln with making. And how tricky of a political move was this for Lincoln in terms of maintaining the allegiance of his Union states? Right. Obviously, the conflict itself wouldn't have happened and the South seceded partly because of these actions, but he was concerned about the effect that these maneuvers that emancipation and arming these troops would have on border states and right. the people living therein? It's, it's a great question and it's a complicated question. There are at least two levels here. The first level is universal white supremacy in the North. The North was certainly not Northerners. White Northerners were not prepared for emancipation. Union soldiers from, from Kansas to Maine had not enlisted in their state units with the goal of emancipation. Lincoln had promised them that this was a war to keep the Union intact. Emancipation was never part of their intention. Hence, when the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation appeared on September 22, 1862, there were many officers in these state units throughout the North, they were thus serving in the South, who said that they were going to resign. Now, the second part of your question is really an important one, the four loyal slave states. Now these loyal slave states, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri, they all sent troops to the Union Army. Missouri and Kentucky sent large contingents of troops, as you know, to both Union and Confederate forces. But Lincoln was a Kentuckian. His wife's family owned 50 slaves in Kentucky uh, in, as late as 1860, and Lincoln was very concerned about these loyal slave states who at times didn't act so, so much like loyal states. Uh, they acted more like disloyal states. Lincoln tiptoed and he gave mixed messages. Lincoln was a master politician. He would create smoke screens saying as late as late 1862 that he had no plans to do anything with the slaves as long as the Confederate states returned to the Union. But in fact, as you know, uh, from the summer of 1862, Lincoln was planning his emancipation policy. If I may, I want to mention the four key points that suggest how much of a linear move Lincoln was making, because these were congressional actions, actions that Lincoln could have vetoed, he could have prevented, but he quietly and slyly supported them. As early as August 1861, Lincoln supported congressional action in what's called the First Confiscation Act. Early in the new year, in March of 1862, Lincoln also supported a new article of war, followed in July of 1862 with two other acts, the Second Confiscation Act and what's called the Militia Act. Now, these four pieces of legislation, in subtle and not so subtle ways, 
Number one, prevented the rendition of Confederate slaves, that means the return of Confederate slaves, who entered Union lines. Now, early in the war, Lincoln said, when, when slaves of loyal masters came to Union lines, they, they would be returned. But it became very difficult to determine who was a loyal master and who was not. And as the war was not going well for the Union Army, Lincoln and his commanders had a very difficult time with this because, um, as Lincoln pointed out, every slave that left the Confederacy was what Lincoln called a double gain for the Union. It removed slave labor from the Confederates and brought that labor, and later that not just labor, but armed military personnel to the Union Army. A third factor, as the great African-American historian and sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois pointed out in his 1935 book, Black Reconstruction, that this undercut the whole Southern Weltanschauung, Weltanschauung the whole way in which uh, Southerners defined their lives, that, that, that blacks, were number one, were of course not happy as slaves, and that blacks could take up action against the Confederacy. Now, the last two acts, the two in July of 1862, the Second Confiscation Act and the Militia Act, these actually authorized the president to use African Americans any way he saw fit to suppress the rebellion in military and non-military ways. So even before the final Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863 went into effect, authorizing the utilization of black soldiers. Lincoln had that authority in his pocket. Now you've discussed previously the importance of judging historical figures' actions through the historical lens of the time in which they were operating. And I think on a first reading of this book, people who understand the traditional narrative of Lincoln and, and emancipation might be taken aback by the gradualness of the way he approached this. But as you just mentioned in your answer to the last question, perhaps this gradual approach was more likely to ensure the success of the cause overall, considering the different players involved? Very good point. Uh, in, indeed, ideas die hard. Lincoln began the war maintaining that it was a war for the maintenance of the Union. But he realized to accomplish that goal, he could not keep the status quo antebellum. So he had to not only affect social, political, and military change slowly, but he had to prepare the country for it. So while he was giving these mixed messages, no, I'm not going to do anything with slavery, he was working behind the scenes. And I think it is putting Lincoln within the context of his day to realize the social, political, and cultural forces that restrained him. Lincoln was never an abolitionist. He was an anti-slavery Whig, and he became an anti-slavery Republican. Now, the anti-slavery people favored gradual emancipation, they favored compensated emancipation, and they favored colonization. Lincoln had espoused that, was that trio of anti-slavery views and policies oh, since the 1840s and well through the 1850s. The abolitionists, however, um, William Lloyd Garrison and later Frederick Douglass, um, and these people, they favored a much more radical kind of social change. They favored immediate emancipation. They opposed compensation or, or paying back slaveholders for their property, even loyal slaveholders, because they believed that slavery was a sin, no matter what the Constitution said. And third, they opposed colonization. Fourth, the abolitionists were a biracial movement. Lincoln was very slow to incorporate African Americans in any kind of decision-making policy, not until very late in the war did he even uh, bring Frederick Douglass into his inner council? In fact, uh, Lincoln's government promised more or less Frederick Douglass a commission in the U.S. colored troops, and it never came to pass. But as you know, two of uh, Frederick Douglass's children served in African American units. Now, once the decision was made to emancipate and mobilize, what kind of logistical challenge 
was Lincoln and the Union leadership looking at in terms of mobilizing these troops given the limited, to say the least, communication networks of the day? Thank you. Good question. Many of your viewers are familiar with the 1989 movie Glory. And I, while I think that movie is very powerful, and of course it's Hollywood, so it has its limitations, uh, one of the strengths and the weaknesses of that movie is just what you're talking about. The idea of metaphorically integrating, but not literally integrating the U.S. Army. Um, the African American units were segregated. Their officers were white, the highest rank in most cases that an African American could um, achieve or attain in the U.S. colored troops was the rank of sergeant. So this became a very large mobilization. And as I said at the, at the top of your program, in March of 1863, a uh, infrastructure, a bureaucracy was established, the Bureau for Colored Troops, the Bureau of Colored Troops, of the U.S. Colored Troops, setting in motion the federalizing of these black troops. Now, as you may know, most Union soldiers, well over 95% of Union soldiers served in state units. The first Ohio volunteers, the second Ohio volunteers, etc., at every state level. But the U.S. colored troops were federalized, and that is very important. It took the whole process or the mobilization that you asked about out of the hands of state governments and put it under the control of the federal government because Lincoln's government understood that there was so much opposition to, to African Americans serving in the military to being defined as citizens. Again, the idea of blacks with guns was a very scary question, a very scary ideal in an idea in the American South, in the slaveholding South, but also in the antebellum North because of the opposition throughout the North and particularly in the border states. The border states during the Civil War passed passed very virulent legislation, anti-black legislation, to, to prevent African Americans from coming into those states, fleeing the South and slavery. So it was a large mobilization, but it was a mobilization that maintained the segregation of black units that were led by white officers. Now once the fighting began and these troops became involved, you write that they faced the twin forces of white racism and military necessity. Right. What sort of hardships were these soldiers facing? Thank you, good question. African Americans uh, endured all manner of discrimination uh, in the ranks of the U.S. colored troops from not being able to, um, despite their ability, serve as officers. The highest rank, as I just mentioned, was sergeant in most cases. There were about 100 uh, commissioned officers, but they served as surgeons and and chaplains and in support roles uh, and as recruiters, particularly late in the war. There were some second lieutenants and some first lieutenants in, in the Massachusetts regiments uh, and in a Connecticut regiment and in a Rhode Island regiment. Um, African Americans received the worst assignments. It was assumed that African Americans could, could thrive in, in behavioral and, envir and epidemiological environments where whites could not work, such as um, miasmatic swamps um, and a low country in occupied uh, South Carolina and North Carolina and in the Gulf and all the way to East Texas. So African Americans were posted in the most not necessarily dangerous spots militarily but in terms of health hazards in the most dangerous dismal places that whites um, did not want to serve. African Americans received inferior equipment, equipage, union, uh, hand-me-downs in terms of um, uniforms, weapons, African Americans, like older brothers, metaphorically, received the new items and the hand-me-downs in weapons, equipment, uh, everything from horses to mules um, was, was second or third rate. African Americans received inferior medical care. It was very hard for these units to acquire regimental surgeons, so they oftentimes received people with inadequate training. African Americans received food um, and um, cultural things, ministers, that were not prepared to um, 
sucker the African Americans. African Americans were used to having high carbohydrate diet of hog meat and hoe cake, of pork and corn. They were given beef and wheat products that white soldiers from the Midwest were most familiar with. They also weren't provided with African American uh, clergymen early in their service who were familiar with their cultural traditions. Now, in terms of shaping the conversation following the end of the war, how important was the pairing of emancipation with military service, one, to African Americans' ability to demand citizenship for themselves, sure. and two, in changing the perception of some of these white soldiers who fought with them? It's complicated. It takes us back to the, the dual types of emancipation proclamations Lincoln uh, put forth. September 22nd, he issued a preliminary emancipation proclamation that, that was a threat to the Confederate South saying that if by January 1st, 1863, the Southerners did not stop their rebellion, then effective January 1st, 1863, the slaves then held in territory in a state of rebellion would be emancipated. Of course, Lincoln knew and the Confederates knew that that was a paper proclamation. January 1st, 1863 came and the final Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. At the very end of the final Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln threw in a small clause saying that he would start initiating the mobilization of African American troops at once. The Confederates said something like, see, Lincoln not only was a hypocrite, he was a liar. He said he wasn't going to do this all along, and now here he goes. Jefferson Davis tried to whip up the Confederate South into a, a racial frenzy, if you will, saying that, look what's going to happen. We're going to be attacked by our own slaves. There will be servile insurrection in our midst by Yankees who are inciting black uprising. Well, once Lincoln had initiated this, there was no going back. Lincoln realized that once he armed and mobilized black soldiers and initiated the flood of black slaves coming to Union lines, the, the wives and children and siblings of these black soldiers. There was, as I said, Du Bois in 1935 re re responded to all of this by seeing this was a, 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 a slowdown of work. This was a, a, an uprising from within the Confederacy. And while Du Bois was a polemicist and he may have overstated his case, I think that it really did ring true. African Americans did leave the farms and plantations and come to Union lines. Lincoln realized that, and he started in, in the end of 1863, that this was a proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation. This was an act of the Commander-in-Chief. It was not backed by law. There was no Congressional Act. So at the end of 1863, and I'm sure many of your viewers have seen the Spielberg movie, Lincoln, Lincoln began the very long and arduous task of passing first constructing, then passing what became the 13th Amendment, which finally passed Congress in January of 1865, and of course was not ratified until long after Lincoln was in his grave in December of 1865. And not all the northern states ratified it, as you know. Lincoln realized that once black soldiers fought, and they did fight, they did more than just fatigue labor and perhaps you'll ask me about that later. Once black soldiers fought for the Union cause and died for the Union cause, citizenship would, in, in some way or another, would have to follow. And, in, and late in his, in his life, four days before he was assassinated, and in some letters before that to his commanders and his provisional governors, particularly in Arkansas and Louisiana, Lincoln said that his plan for, he used the word, restoration, which we call reconstruction. Lincoln argued that, his, that we had, he would have to do something for the men who have served our cause in the army. So clearly, at his death, he was thinking about a restoration that included some citizenship rights. He even mentioned limited black suffrage for your audience, that means the vote for men who had served his cause, our cause, in the Union Army. Now, given you just touched on 
an issue that I was about to bring up and we're running short on time, I'd like to bring you back to sort of the thousand foot perspective with one final question. Uh, occasionally throughout history, and American history in particular, those in a position of leadership have used their powers to be the agents of social change, to push things progressively, perhaps further than the general population opinion-wise was. I'm curious, where do you see Lincoln in terms of his opinions on emancipation and citizenship and those related issues? Where was he as opposed to the general population? Was he pushing the issue? Very good question. I think Lincoln was pushing the issue in ways that most historians heretofore have not quite identified. Of course, he was not on the cutting edge of racial change. He was not um, arguing uh, for racial equality. Lincoln was a, he cherished ideals, but he was not an idealist. He was a pragmatist. And Lincoln realized that in order to keep the Union together, or in this case, to restore the Union, he had to be advanced on the race question. Circumstances controlled him. I'm paraphrasing Lincoln's, one of his famous lines in his uh, second inaugural. Circumstances led him to become much more active on the race question. Number one, with emancipation and militarizing the African-American community north and south. Well, that's all the time we have for Live Wire today. Dr. Smith, thank you very much for stopping by. Really interesting conversation. His book, Lincoln and the U.S. Colored Troops, is on the shelves now. Go check it out. It's a great read.